Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we proceed in our study in Judges 11 and Leviticus 27, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may more properly understand that which is being presented before us. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, as we open your word today, we find that there are things that we are not understanding. We need your guidance. We need your spirit to direct us and instruct us. We need your angels to surround us. Help us today so that we might more clearly understand that which is going to be before us. Father, I thank you for each one that is here for this meeting and for those that will attend later via the internet. Help us now so that we might be able to properly come together, putting our minds and our ideas together before each other, wrestling properly with this word of truth. Show us that that you would have us to understand. For this, Father, we ask. For this, we thank you. And for this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. When we left off yesterday, we were dealing with Judges 11, verse 30, where Jephthah has vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh, cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, surely shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. <clears throat> now, Jephthah is expressing faith. He is expressing faith that he is going to return from this time against the children of Ammon in peace. Yet he is making a vow. That which cometh forth, which shall come forth from the, of the doors of my house to meet me, shall surely be the Lord's. <clears throat> now, the modern day transcribers would say here that this is Jephthah's tragic vow. Jephthah does not envision that it's going to be his daughter that's going to come out to meet him. Jephthah does not envision that it is his, it is his daughter that's going to come to meet him with timbrels and dancing, as in a very happy, joyous occasion. Why is this vow so important? Okay, well, first let's look at a couple of things that, that as I looked at this, I thought about. So first, you had, had gone to Leviticus 27. The translators had gone there, yes. Yeah. Now, when we go there, the question is, if he's vowed this vow, um, is the suggestion that you can substitute money for a person when you make a vow regarding a person? Is that what Leviticus 27 is about? Well, <clears throat> okay. In the six, 1769 Oxford Revised Version of the King James, 
the first reference that is given. When a man shall make a singular vow <clears throat> would take us to Numbers 6, 2. Now, Talk about the Nazarite vow. That's the what? That's the Nazarite vow that he's okay. talking about. Okay. And then it tells us immediately to go see Judges 11, 30, 31, and 39. Now we're looking at 30 and 31 right now. 39. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man. And it was a custom in Israel. Now, <clears throat> the question that, that would be asked in this situation, did Jephthah then burn his daughter on the altar? Was human sacrifice acceptable unto God? No. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. But that doesn't mean that during the period of the judges, people wouldn't do something that was not acceptable. Okay. Right, because they did a lot of crazy things, even when they were in their mind following God. So he may have felt that he had no choice. Well, now, as I'm looking, going back to Judges 27, when I look at verse 3, mm -hmm. we, have just, we have just established in verse 2, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when a man shall make a singular vow, the persons shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. Right, so this is Leviticus 27. Yes, yeah, excuse me, Leviticus 27. And, yeah. <clears throat> Verse 3. <clears throat> and thy estimation shall be of the male from 20 years old even unto 60 years old. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, so the question I have, though, if this is the law in Leviticus 27, and it's telling you that when you make a vow, and this is the same type of vow Jephthah made, this is giving the amount of money that the person can be redeemed by. Is that what it's it's saying? In the well, that's, that's why I was reading the verse to see if we would agree on that or not. Okay. So to complete, okay. to, to read the entire verse. And thy estimation shall be of the male from 20 years old, even unto 60 years old, even thy estimation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. And the cross reference here became Exodus 30 verse 13. Now that reads, this they shall give every one that passes among them that are numbered half a shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 geras, and half a shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. So how are we to approach that? Well, I, I don't know how that relates to Leviticus 27, because that's just when they numbered Israel, that's basically a type of tax. Um, but so this is 
So the idea that this vow is when a person's dedicated to the Lord. Right, they're going to be for the Lord. And they, they have a price. And, and is this for, is this for redeeming a person or or offering, because it's going to deal with offerings as well, um, that were meant for burnt offerings, and you decide to redeem them? Or what is this for? Because if, if he could redeem his daughter, he could have just given an offering instead. With it, or you brought up Numbers 3, before we came up here, about the Levites. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that which we've studied before, so that we have, well, there's five shekels that they have to do to redeem uh, the firstborn. But that, I don't see how that relates to this question. Any of this re relates to Jephthah's vow, in that, other than the fact that if he could have redeemed, his daughter, he doesn't seem to have believed he could. Well, <clears throat> in looking through this in Leviticus 27, mm -hmm. the verses as they read, we've just established that if it's a male of 20 unto 60, then the estimation would be 50 shekels of silver. Yeah. Yeah. So we have these lists here, which I've read through, but I don't understand this chapter. I don't understand what, what this estimation of the value of these people that shall be for the Lord is. Is this to redeem them? So, so what if, else a could it be? A vow, if a man makes a vow, you're just saying that you pay this much instead of offering that person to the Lord? It, to me, it's not clear. I've read it over. I've looked at the commentaries, everything I can find. And nobody seems to answer that question. And, and it doesn't seem to come directly here of what this is talking about. Now, when there's animals and, you know, if you offered an, if you gave an animal and you decided to redeem that animal, then you add a fifth part of the value of the estimation of that animal. But is this talking about offering people? Is this talking about the idea that would happen with Jephthah's vow that you you offer a person to the to the Lord, whether it's it's going to be a burnt sacrifice or just to the service as a servant to the Lord? Is this just a way of getting out of that vow by paying for that person? So that nobody explains it, and I don't understand it. So if 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 um if Samuel if she if his mother would have um would have not wanted to give the child, she would pay the shekels to um, redeem him. Well, well, that's kind of seems to be what it's saying. You know, I mean, if if that's what it's saying, if it's talking about a vow like what Jephthah did or what uh, Samuel's mother did, that you Hannah, could. Hannah. And I don't know if that's what Leviticus twenty-seven is actually saying or not. How does verse ten apply with this? Okay, so it's going to talk about a beast, right? So in verse 9, it says, And if it be a beast whereof men bring an offering unto the Lord, all that any man giveth of such unto the Lord shall be holy. He shall not alter in it, nor change it, a good for a bad, or a bad for a good. And if he shall at all change beast for beast, then it and the exchange thereof shall be holy. And if it be an unclean beast... Right, so it's going to go into this, um, and it's going to talk about redeeming these things too. So it, 
I'm not sure what it's talking about. That's all I'm saying is it I don't even understand what the principle is here. I mean, yes, if you if you make uh, an offering to the Lord, you you can't change it. And if you do, well, then you're going. Both of them are going to be holy. That is, they're set apart, dedicated. So you can't really, when it comes to an animal, in in that case, to bring it as an offering. But of course, an unclean beast you're not going to offer. So the priest is going to value it, and then you add a fifth part. So. Isn't he vowing to give over the church to the Lord? Yeah, so something's being given over to the Lord, right? Whether it's going to be a person, whether it's going to be an animal, whether it's going to be a, a man's house, his land, his field, right? All of these things can be given to God. And then these are certain rules regarding prices regarding the value of of these various things and how that's determined so we can see that he can redeem um you know an unclean beast and if he sanctifies his house or his field um those would be returned on on at the time of jubilee and, and its value shall be determined based upon its closeness to the time of Jubilee. And, and that word sanctify that's used all the time, that just means to set it aside for holy use. So, so a person may set it aside for the Lord, you know, as, as an offering. But I just don't understand this valuing of a person if I mean, if you're giving them to the Lord, are you saying that you can redeem them? You can just pay the value instead. I don't. I don't understand the the language here. What it's trying to convey is these are vows. Okay. Now, from the chat, the comment was made that um, one. One brother believes that this was redemption of the firstborn. Well, that could easily apply in the situation here with Jephthah's daughter, since he had neither son nor daughter other than her. So she was his firstborn. Mm -hmm. But when we look at this entire chapter, in this vow, you have people, you have beasts, and you have the land. Mm -hmm. Now, all of this is important as far as God is concerned. And it is showing, I, I would have to assume, from the way that this is written, that this is showing that the vow can be redeemed. But now, figuratively, how would we look to approach this? Okay, so Leviticus 7, verse 2, when it talks about a singular vow, the Hebrew there means a vow of separation, um, which, uh, I mean, literally the word pala uh, means to separate. Um So I don't know. Um, I mean, the Nazarite vow is a type of separation as well. Um, but this word is rarely translated as separate, even though that's what it means. It's usually used figuratively. So it's usually used in idiomatic expressions. Um, the most common way it's translated is to some degree like marvelous, wondrous, wonderful, wonders, marvelously. Um, 
miracles, marvels, but it is uh, translated as separate. Um, when it, in regards to number 6-2, um, it's basically the same word. When it talks about the Nazarite vow, in number 6-2, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When either a man or a woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, that's exactly the same word as singular. So the singular vow or to separate of themselves to vow is the same idea. So in this, in, in the way that we're approaching this, mm -hmm. this singular or separation is going to give us a, a good foundation for what we will study next, which will be Samson. Right. And so there must be something similar in what we see with Samuel, with Samson, and with Jephthah's daughter, as far as what this vow is. So that right. might indicate that it's not going to be a burnt offering. It's, it's actually in service to the Lord that he makes this vow. Right. And he expected maybe a servant to come. And then he would just give that servant to serve for the Lord. Okay. Was his daughter through. And since he had no heir, that would be his only heir. Uh, it's the only so, heir to have is her. In, in this in this situation with his family, he's basically committing everything of value. Mm -hmm. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah. Now he doesn't realize what he's doing. Right. And he doesn't realize the type of sacrifice that this is going to require. So uh, for me, the revelation that I had regarding Judges chapter 11 and, and the problem that I was struggling with is I didn't know what time this was referring to. And if we look at the story of Jephthah, and this is, that this is about the message of July 18th, wouldn't this vow have to do with the sacrifice that was going to be required, but Jephthah never realized what that sacrifice was, and that that would apply to this movement? Would it would it be sort of like uh, this is just a thought that would it be like uh, like Abraham when he took Isaac sacrificed him but he didn't sacrifice him wouldn't this be the same as well well it might be the reverse of that maybe um, but you know we already applied the offering of Isaac to the July 18 2020 prediction Jeff did as well as other things like uh, the story of Jonah. And, and so they illustrate different aspects of the July 18 prediction. So one of the things about uh, the story of offering of Isaac was the faith required to make a prediction regarding time when we know that there is no time, that Ellen White says time will never be a test. And so we, by faith, have to make this prediction, knowing that there is time, but it's not, we know it's not the time that, you know, the second coming or anything like that. But in that case, God's hand uh, is stayed, right? Or Abraham's hand is stayed by God, right? So Abraham's not going to kill Isaac. So that prediction, so to speak, fails. But when, when we come to the story of Jephthah, it's almost, in a sense, the reverse. So this is the message of July 18. And, and Jephthah is looking for victory. He has faith in, in the prediction. But in doing that, he is making a vow. He's setting aside 
something of value, but he doesn't, for service to God, but he doesn't realize that it's going to be his daughter. So this would, to me, point to the fact that the sacrifice of the July 18th message was greater than we would have expected because we were expecting that the event would occur, we would be vindicated, you know, we would be able to witness to our family and friends. And one of the big disappointments for many people was the fact that now they felt they had no fluence, no influence with family and friends. And so that this prediction must have been false and we must have been misled in some way to make that prediction. So the vow would be um, the giving of the prediction regarding July 18th. Because we have the message of Jephthah, but he's then that message has to be given. And when we published that message at uh, in the Tennessean about what was going to happen in Nashville, that would have been equivalent to the vow. Has anybody seen merit in what I'm saying? Well, you're answering part of the question that I asked earlier. Okay. Because you're approaching this from a symbolic aspect. Yeah, yeah. So, in this, using it and looking at it figuratively, we are showing how this vow, interrelated with July 18th, interrelated with the message of Nashville, and now how the movement, as represented by Jephthah, is shocked because that which has been valued not so much the daughter but the standing of the movement potentially before others has now been laid low mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> figuratively, could we have redeemed ourselves after this message had gone out? Could, could we, we have, have redeemed, have, could we have provided a redemption since this did not occur as we had thought it would? Well, what would the redemption be? Would that just be kind of a way out? Well, for some, it was a way out because they turned from anything having to do further with this message. Mm -hmm. Those of us that are continuing to study, we recognize, number one, that the message had been given by God to his prophet and that this message is true. The message had to go forward to the world. Else, how, how could, when the event does occur, how could some say that they were aware of this and then have others coming to them to say, I was your neighbor. Why didn't you tell me? We know this is going to happen. We have accepted the validity of the prophecy. The portion that needed to be done to put this before the world has now been done. Even if the movement is now castigated for presenting this we're not wrong mm -hmm. 
So in the figurative sense, we are seeing and experiencing the disappointment that Jephthah has had. But now we have this situation. We have, as this, as this goes, so Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. So Jephthah, the movement, presented the warning, and the warning went out to the world. Mm -hmm. And he smote them from a roarer, even until come to Mineth, even 20 cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. Now, what does Aurora or Mineth mean from the Hebrew? Um, so aurora uh, means uh, uh, nudity of situation, so something that's exposed. Okay, and yeah. could we would would we then see that our erroneous belief has now been exposed? Um. Well, I don't know so much if it's an erroneous belief that's exposed, but we definitely are exposed. No, our, our belief that this was going to vindicate us before the world. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now what about Mineth? Well, it means to enumerate. I mean, it's related to the word... Um, uh, uh, Mana or, or uh, mini, right? The idea of measuring um, has lots of different uh, different relations to this word. So, in other words, the relation to this world is mini, mini, tekel, you farson. Yeah. Well, because a man, a mana is that 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 uh, the mina. Measure. Yeah, the mina. It's mana in Ezekiel, but mm. um, yeah, that that is a an enumeration or something that's apportioned, right? Um, a part of something. So it's it's related to the seven times. Yes. So our belief that this message was going to allow us to give this message to family, friends, and have them join with us is now exposed. Mm -hmm. Well, it's and, and exposed. I mean, the word also means ruins because of ruins are, you know, cities destroyed. It's exposed. So, yeah, so this is basically a type of destruction that happened to the movement. Okay. Failure no. of conviction. Why 20 cities? Well, the only thing I can think about the 20, because you're also going to have um, the two months. Right. Um, and these are, are doublings. 20 is a doubling of 10. Two is a doubling of one but 20 being a doubling of 10 means a doubling of judgment right since 10 is the number of judgment well yeah or a test it's not necessarily just judgment it can 10 represents a test as well but in yeah, this, in his in three friends being tested 10 days okay I, since this was a test, the Millerites were given a test. And what Father Miller was doing in this test is he was proclaiming 
that Christ's second coming was going to happen first in 1843 and then in 1844. Mm -hmm. He based a message upon time, even though it was very clear within scripture that no man knoweth the day or the hour of his coming, right? Mm -hmm. So we had a message based upon time. Mm -hmm. It was a test. Are you willing to give this message? Are you willing to be exposed and stand naked before the world? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to have your beliefs fully examined? Not only by yourself, but by all of those that you have called friend and family. Is that not a test, a fairly great test? Mm -hmm. No, and it's pretty clear that this movement was heading for a test. And then when the test happened, I mean, for many, it was too much to bear. Right. Right. They just left the movement. And but we're still continuing that test as well, because with there was two aspects, I guess, to that. One was Trump being president. The other one was the July 18 prediction. And if to me that there's there's a direct parallel to those who rejected July 18th and to those who believe that trump has to be president again in order for that prophecy to be fulfilled that if he doesn't become president again then we have failed again right that's that's the belief that's out there and to me that's a rejection of what jeff taught about trump right So we have these two tests, and they are unto the plane of the vineyards. So is are these two tests to be based upon biblical doctrine? Mm -hmm. How could we see, or how how would we promote? Trump was being based upon biblical doctrine. You mean the, the, the prediction that he's going to come again, isn't it? Right. Can that be supported by biblical doctrine? Well, no. And okay. Yeah, it can't. And and really, it's it's a mixing together of because the chronology is correct i mean for the most part odilio's and collins chronology is correct but they're interpreting it incorrectly because if we can't understand that the pandemic was a type of the sunday law and that uh trump fulfilled his role already in what we predicted uh, you know, if we if we can't understand that, we're then we can't we're going to mix it into this idea that he has to be elected again, and and of course the fact that they don't want to hear the reasons, I, I think, is a real problem. I mean, it'd be fine if somebody had a view that's incorrect, because we all have views that are incorrect. But if somebody has a view that's incorrect and doesn't even want to hear an explanation of why their view is incorrect, then that's that's a problem. So so the message of July 18th, we know that it was successful. So it it smote them from Aurora, even to Lucum to Minneth, even 20 cities. So there's two places from Aurora to Minneth, 20 cities. Um, are going to be destroyed, right? Or, or not destroyed, but at least they're going to smite 
20 cities. Right. And, and to me, this is a symbol where we can say it's a test, but it's a doubling of a test. And so it's, it's a symbol of the midnight cry. It's a symbol of the July 18, 2020 prediction. Right. Now, we expected there to be a great slaughter, which there wasn't on July 18th. But symbolically, uh, that, that prediction was fulfilled. Because it was about the movement, not about what was happening in the world. Even though it was witnessed to by events in the world, we weren't predicting those of the events that, that witnessed to it, for one, except maybe the pandemic. But also, um, um, the, the, the events that, that we had predicted are still sure in our future, but we could not predict those, and we still can't. We can't predict when Nashville is going to be hit by a fireball, whether that's a nuclear attack or whatever the, the reason is. We can't predict when that's going to be. And we can't predict these things that we're trying to predict about Trump. Because if we do that, we're rejecting, we're rejecting our message. Who does Ammon represent? Well, I would be asking if, given the way that, that Jephthah has had to approach this, if the Ammonites are not representing the corporate church. It could be said to be representing the world, but I'm just seeing that the children of Ammon, of Ben Ami, as a relation to the children of Israel, would either have to be the church or it would have to be the Protestants as a whole. Yeah, it would have to be either of those. So. So why does his daughter go to the mountain? Well, we're going to get to that in a moment. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. So this answers the, the comment earlier about the redemption of the firstborn. She was his only child. She was his firstborn and his only so the alternate readings would would leave us with this and jephthah came to mizpah unto his house and behold his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and dances and she was his only child he had not of his own either son nor daughter So, in the Hebrew and in the alternate readings, it's being very specific. He did not have another child. Right. He has no heir. He has no heir. That's it. She's, she is everything. Mm-hmm. Now, and he, he's not going to try to redeem her even though technically he could have based on Leviticus 27? That's that's what I'm seeing. Okay. So now she's dedicated to the Lord, which means she's not going to get married, which means she's not going to have children, so he'll have no heir. So she would not she in this in this situation would not be that of which women of that time 
hoped for to be the mother of the uh, the savior. Mm -hmm. But also just to carry on the, the, you know, you need an heir for all your possessions. Right. So he's not going to have an heir. Can't carry on so, family names. So this, this gives a good representation then also of Jephthah as being a symbol of future for America. Yeah. So, so Jephthah, I mean, I, I mean, the message of Jephthah or the work is the giving of July 18th. Now, I, so I wouldn't say that Future for America is Jephthah because um, we have um, the people of Gilead who, who are actually more representative of that in right. that they reject July 18th and then they call for the message of July 18th. But definitely FFA uh, takes this message of July 18th and, and runs with it. And in giving, and it's not just that we're talking about it, but I think the vow relates to specifically the publishing of that message and that it became a worldwide publication. That is, it wasn't just that we published it and nobody noticed it. It was obviously noticed by the church and by the world so as i mentioned other places my pastor said that he was contacted by this group of pastors it was sort of like the elite group of pastors in north america and they asked him about me knowing that i was um uh, his uh in that he was my pastor so so it obviously got the attention of the church and of the world. I mean, it wasn't the biggest news, but maybe not even in Adventism. I'm not sure every Adventist knew about it, but definitely lots of people did. And so, so that's what uh, is going to happen. You're going to have this, this public, this message of July 18th, and it's going to be published. And, and that message creates a bigger sacrifice for those that give it, for those that publish it, than they would have known, than they would have expected. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Now, rending his clothes. Here, we have the examples of Reuben and Jacob. When Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. And then in, J in five verses later, and Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. Reuben was upset because his brothers had chosen to go forward with Simeon's idea to sell Joseph. Jacob rends his clothes because it's his belief that Joseph is dead. So this is a, a symbol of mourning, great mourning, right? This is a, more than just a symbol of being upset. Mm -hmm. Now his daughter is being said as being one that troubles him for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord in Ecclesiastes Solomon gives us the admonition be not rash with thy mouth and not 
and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven and thou are upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. Solomon is trying to tell us to be very careful, not to speak rashly. Jephthah is seeing that he has been rash with his vow. He didn't think things through. Now. Okay, so he didn't think, think things through. Right. Now, of course, we were supposed to give that warning. Right. Now, as far as thinking things through, I mean, we, we did. I just don't think we fully understood our condition. Agreed. And now, on April 26, 2020, I sent Jeff an email with my insight into the 777 chiasm so that there was four periods of 777 days with 183 days in between. And I thought Jeff, you know, he said he was going to watch the video I did on it. He said he was going to read what I had to say about it. And it appeared that he was heading in that direction in his presentations. But he never did address that point. And the point was that I believe that it was possible that our prediction was going to fail because it was on a line of failed predictions. And I didn't see how um, we could get around that, you know, from what what we saw symbolically. And and it was suggested by some when, when I published it, because I didn't just send it to Jeff, I sent it to others. I think it was Odilio kind of said, well, no, this actually shows that you're going to be correct, um, because now it's going to not fail. All these other predictions were failures, and this one won't fail. But, and as much as I saw all the evidence pointed to the Nashville prediction, and I, I kept stating that, I still believe that it was possible it would not, not happen. And especially as the closer we got to it, and, and that was because of the condition of the movement. I couldn't see how God could entrust a people that were so divided with with the responsibility that would fall upon our shoulders. So if we're talking about that we didn't consider it carefully, what we didn't really consider was our own condition. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, what is what is the first issue that is noted with the Laodiceans? Well, the, the first thing that is noted? Yeah. Okay. So, um, we're, well, we're neither hot or cold. We're lukewarm. What is the first physical issue? Well, it says, I am rich. That's an attitude. Yeah. Okay. Isn't blindness the first physical issue? Um, well, in the sense, thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Um, I don't see how blindness, unless it's just a blindness to their own condition. If you're blind, you're not going to see anything else. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see that you're actually poor. You're not going to see that you're wretched. You're not going to see that you're, you know, all of these other things. Are you? Right. And that's why the message of righteousness by faith, properly understood, means you will see yourself as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Right. And, and see, the thing is, Here's how many Adventists think of this, and, and, and it, it always surprises me because they don't see the irony in it. But they'll say, 
Well, this Laodicean, refer, Laodicean message is to those Adventists that are wretched, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But, you know, I'm not one of those. But, but what they're saying is, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, right? Okay. So, so they're actually taking the attitude of a Laodicean by saying they're not wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Right. They don't see themselves as Laodicean, but they see what what he describes as the Laodicean condition. So we think of the Laodicean condition as the bad part of that line. But actually, the condition is the fact that you actually don't recognize your condition. Right. Because everyone is wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. Even Christ describes himself in that way. Psalms and and by implication in the things that he says about himself. So we need to know our our spiritual condition. But what we try to do as Seventh-day Adventists is to hide from our spiritual condition. We try to make ourselves better so that we 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 won't see ourselves as our true condition. So we, we have to recognize we're not rich. That we have great need. Because those are that's the lay of to see in condition, not knowing your great need, not knowing how much we're dependent upon God. Not knowing that you are spiritually blind when you think you're spiritually rich. Right. Each of those admonitions, I don't look to apply it to others. I look to apply it to myself. Oh, yeah. It's easy to see that other people are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It's not so easy to see that you are. It's also not so easy to admit. Mm -hmm. Our situation as a movement before July 18th. And that has continued with the movement is spiritual blindness. Mm -hmm. The message of righteousness by faith has not, to this point, been fully revealed and fully understood. Now, I think this is this is another aspect of this portion of the example with Jephthah that we're going to have to consider. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, when Jephthah says, I cannot go back, the translators, again, came to Numbers 30, verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Psalms 15, 4. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 and 5, 5. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldst not vow than thou shouldst vow and not pay. Okay, I, I have another question. So you know, I've struggled with this this vow for for a long time. Um, now, who's the daughter? Who's the daughter? Okay, I don't see that we've ever been told who the daughter is. Well, yeah, but I mean symbolically. So one of the things that she says, she says. 
um, my father, if thou had hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. Now, would not this be the attitude of Christ? Would this also not be the attitude of Isaac? Yeah, of Isaac. So, so we see Isaac and Christ. Obviously, it's the same. You know, they're pointing to that that figure. But you know, so one of the things is whether you know he actually offers her up as a burnt offering or not. I mean, he's not going to redeem her, right? I mean, he's not going to pay money so that she doesn't, so that he can go back on his vow. And and he doesn't believe that he can can go back. That is, that's the Hebrew word shuv. Um, so that he cannot turn from what he had um, vowed. And so whether whatever happens to her, at least we can see it, it's it's the attitude of Christ. Right? It's the attitude of Isaac. She is not unwilling for this vow to be fulfilled however we take it whether it's just that she's not going to be married and has to be given into the service of the sanctuary or that she's actually going to be offered as a burnt offering whichever it is it it, it doesn't really matter in the sense that this is the attitude of christ christ freely offered himself would she be a young church yeah, so, well, it could represent a movement. It could represent the church as well. And we know the 144,000 are going to have that say, the same words that went from Christ's lips upon the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those same words are going to come from the lips of the 144,000 during the time of Jacob's trouble. And so this message is going to lead to a sacrifice that that goes beyond what we understood this message was about. Even though as Seventh-day Adventists, we should understand it. I, Ellen White says regarding what's going to happen during the time of Jacob's trouble, that many things, or most things, or almost all things, I can't remember her exact phrase, but things that we are going to go through are worse in anticipation than in reality. But this isn't the case with the time of Jacob's trouble. It is we have a sacrifice to make that goes beyond what we can imagine. We have no idea what lays ahead for us as far as a trial. Right. You, you also have, um, she's not going to have any more children. She's typifying the last generation. Ah, yeah. Excellent point. Yeah, good point. So the daughter challenges Jephthah, my father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which is proceeded out of thy mouth. Now, here again, Numbers 30, verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. <coughs> He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. And then she finishes by telling him, For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even the children of Ammon. So the, the reminder here then takes us to 2 Samuel. Then said, Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, <clears throat> let me now run and bear the king tidings, how that the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. And then in 2 Samuel 18, 31, and behold, Cushi came and Cushi said, tidings, my Lord, the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. Now, this is regarding David, right? Mm -hmm. These are tidings unto David. But they're being reminded, the daughter is reminding Jephthah 
here that the Lord's done what he promised. You need to do what you're promising. So the last generation is standing up, is recognizing that they will be as the bride of Christ. Would that be a fair comment? Mm -hmm. So, and she said unto her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And the alternate of the Hebrew, instead of go up and down, is to go and go down upon the mountains. Here we have two symbols we have to consider. Why two months? And why is she now walking the mountains? What do the mountains have to do with this symbolic representation? Okay, so we do know that 20 is based upon the idea of a doubling, right? So that's the Hebrew idea of 20. It's a, it's a doubling of something. Um, now, her going up and down, so that's just, you know, common Hebrew words. Um, so to go up here is halak, which is off, just means to walk. It's translated lots of different ways. And down means to descend. So she's going to walk up and down. And upon the mountains, which is Harim, or Har is mountain, Harim is the plural. And, and then she's going to bewail her virginity. Um, so the idea here uh, is to weep, right? And, and her friends, so it's feminine form. So these are female friends. Um, so two months, I mean, we're obviously not going to take this literally and put it into our time, right? We haven't done that. We usually use them as some kind of a symbol. But if we had two prophetic months, we would be talking 60 prophetic days. Right, which would be 60 years. That's kind of what, um, in the chat there, that's kind of what Angela is sort of looking at. Now, she's not putting them concurrent or, or uh, successively, but concurrently, or at least overlapping. Right, so... The 1989 to 2019 as being the first month and the other month being 1991 to 2021. So that's her suggestion. Okay. So two different periods of 30 years. So instead of putting them so that it's a period of 60 years, we just refer to these two different periods. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to do it. I did notice that if you multiplied... Uh, 60 times 7, and you use that, so we're just multiplying it by the number 7 as a symbol, that if you count from um, July 18th, it would be 420 days to September 11th, 2021. And, and we've already marked that, um, uh, that history um, to 2021, to September 11th, in other studies, um, dealing with the 20 years from 2001 to 2021. So the fact that 420 days goes from July 18th to September 11th is kind of interesting. Whether that's what's being referred to here or not, I don't know. But that's, that's 60 times 7, so 420 days. Any other ideas what these two months can represent? 
So, I mean, they can represent symbols that don't relate to time, and they could represent symbols that relate to time. You have uh, the Midnight Cry was in uh, August. Mm -hmm. So you had August, September, October. Yeah, and if you look from the public, and if you look from the publication of the True Midnight Cry paper, August twenty second, it's going to be two months to October twenty second. So maybe that period of two months there, we can tie it to the period of two months, um, because we mark July eighteenth as the Midnight Cry. Though this is the publication of the Midnight Cry magazine, not. August 15th, but still it has a symbol of two months, and might that refer to the period of time that we're in right now? That right now we're bewailing our virginity for two months, or something to that effect, so a symbol. Right. as a symbol in the, the movement is not to be joined to any other, that is to stand alone. Is that possible? Um, yeah, that's possible. Now, when I take this um, two months, but I take it that a month represents, uh, or the day represents a month instead of a year. So I did it as a week, and now I'm doing it as a month. So I take 30 days in a month, and I multiply 60 by 30. I'm going to get um, 1,800, right? right? So if I count 1,800 days from July 18, 2020, I get another date that's a symbol, and that's, June 22nd, 2025, but still June 22nd, 2025. So we have the symbol there for FFA. And, and another thing we should always note is that June 22nd Gregorian in our time is June 9th um, Julian, and June 9th is a symbol of uh, time in this movement the proclamation of time in this movement. Because that's when we first time set is June 9th, uh, 2018. And 2025 is seven years from that. So, so we might be able to look at it in these different symbolic senses as weeks and months and years. Just the 2025, you have the 2520 there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just in reversed order. Uh, the other thing is uh, 60 days, which is two months, uh, is um, so you take 60 times 24 hours is uh, 1440. So you have another symbol there for the 144,000, which already fits into our interpretation. So this must be referring to the, to the 144,000, or at least the message that relates to the 144,000. It's intriguing that that symbol could be so interrelated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all these different symbols, June 22nd, June 9th, uh, 2520, 144,000, um, all of these things tied in with this symbol of two months. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. 
So bewailing the virginity upon the mountains. Why is this important? Now in the chat, the question or the, the comment was to direct us back to Leviticus 27.7. Since we're using this and we're looking at the two months as a possibility of 60 days, Leviticus 27.7 says, and if it be from 60 years old and above, if the man be from 60 years old and above, if it be a male, then thy estimation shall be 15 shekels, but for the female, 10 shekels. Why would the 15 and the 10 be important for us to know too? So here we have that Jephthah sends his daughter away for two months. She and her friends are now walking these mountains. They are walking, I mean, one way we could say is they're walking from government to government, but what else could we say the mountains could symbolize? Well, I would think it re represents prophecy. Okay. Um, that this is what we have been doing since July 18th. Okay. That is, we've been studying uh, prophecy. So Jephthah's daughter and her companions are representative of those that are continuing to study prophecy. Yeah, well, yeah, we would say that. Then how do the mountains factor into this? Well, I'm saying that the mountains are a symbol that is in prophecy. I mean, it's one of our primary symbols. We've even studied it literally when we were studying Revelation 17, the woman that sits upon these seven mountains upon right. this, on seven mountains so so we've so to me just the idea of mountains to go um up and down upon them would be to study them especially in the context of what we see here of all the other symbols the 2520 the 144,000, june 9th june 22nd um, and uh, September 11th, all of these symbols come together in this, this verse. And they're all prophetic symbols about prophecy and about time. Because even the 1440, even though we, we know it re relates to the 144,000, we know it's the number of hours in a day. Okay. Or not number of hours, number of minutes in a day, pardon me. Twenty four hours times sixty. So that and that's why we get it, because it's sixty days times twenty four hours. So would the fellows be separate from the girl at the church? Well well, yeah, these are females, the fellows here. It's in the feminine form in Hebrew, so it doesn't refer to men. It refers to her female companions. So this, this would represent the church of Christ or the bride of Christ. Now, it doesn't say how many companions she has. But basically, in, in the way that this is translated, we could presume that there is more than two. 
Um, yeah, well. Could it be the people coming out of the church, churches as her fellows? Well. Mountain also represents the church, don't it? Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's the church. Well, I didn't. I didn't say it was. Uh, Archer, I was thinking about different churches. Yeah, but I'm just saying that I and my fellows here, and and I'm trying to just study some of the Hebrew here regarding this. Is there anything else that we could apply there? I mean, I'm <clears throat> I'm seeing this fairly comfortably that the daughter could represent the movement post July 18. Those that are continuing to study. Those that are being prepared. Question ask in the in the chat. Five wise but wailing virgins. Now we're you know, I, I wouldn't have a difficulty if there were five. We're not told that. And it, it does go in line with what, it, what was said earlier, because as I would say that there had to be more than two. So, I mean, when I look at this, two or more would mean that there were three. The three giving representation to the, the three figures of the Godhead. The five giving representation, if, if necessary, to this of the five wise virgins. And my thoughts are, again, the 144,000 are virgins. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, they do a work in bringing the Gentiles in to the kingdom. So that could maybe represent the, the fellows. Okay. And the mountain being Mount Zion, that it's referred to in Revelation 14. The mountain being what, Stephen? Mount, uh, Mount Zion. Mount Zion, okay, interesting. That could work very well. So then, and it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel. And it was an ordinance in Israel. Yeah, which is continuing in the next verse. that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah for days in a year. Now, 
the alternate here, rather than saying to lament, would have been to talk with. And the, there's a reference that's given that we should see Judges 511, 511. <clears throat> they that are delivered from of archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord down to the gates. This was part of the song of Barak and Deborah, right? Yeah, I think so. Yep. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water. The noise of the archers, would that be the noise of Islam? In the places of drawing water, that would have been at the wells. Mm. So they that are delivered from the from Islam near the well of the oath, Bir Shiba. They there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord. Yeah, and it's interesting, Judges 511. Now we know that symbol 511, 511 written in an octal form is 777. So Right. So the, the last verses that were being addressed here when we're talking about who did according to his vow would have taken us to Judges 1131, also into 1 Samuel. Judges 1131, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of mine house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So it's repeating Jephthah's vow. But then it's comparing this with Hannah and her husband, stating, And Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. So in 1 Samuel one twenty four, Hannah is showing that she is coming to the Lord with three bullocks, something that those that were wealthy would have used as an offering. She was not looking to redeem her firstborn. She was accepting that her firstborn was committed unto the Lord. But she brings her firstborn to the tabernacle as had been promised. So she fulfilled her vow. Just as Jephthah and his daughter fulfilled his vow. Mm -hmm. So the way that, that I would approach this 
is while there was a way of redemption, they were choosing to allow this to be part of the service to the tabernacle. They were recognizing that as the firstborn, as the promise of the vow, that this is what the vow needed and how the vow needed to be fulfilled. Yeah, so we see obviously these parallels here. And, and, and so I think we can understand now that this vow, there's nothing wrong with him making this vow. Going going back to Jephthah, right, um, and to say it's a tragic vow is maybe not the correct adjective. It's not tragic in the sense that this is, I mean, it's unforeseen, right. Um, but this is just because there's something that we can't see. You can. You know, until we go through that experience. Right. Now, we also have the four days in a year. That's the last thing we really have to deal with as a symbol. So it's kind of odd that they went to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. I'm not sure why that is the case. Well... I think that we're going to need to, to consider this point until we assemble again on Sunday. Okay. So we'll give this our consideration. There's quite a bit yet that we're going to have to be looking at, especially in reference to the studies on righteousness by faith. And there's quite a bit to be seen yet regarding you know, what we started this last Sabbath on Zephaniah 2 and the portion from what Mrs. White had written that interrelates with Zephaniah 2. So do I we have any, any other comments or questions at this, at this time? I think we have to go to our mountain and be willing to die like Isaac. Oh man. Also I noticed that in in the Hebrew it doesn't say she climbed up, it says go and go down. And I was thinking, well, when Christ returns, you know, when the new earth is prepared, he's going to return with his saints. He'll be coming down with them from the heavenly Mount Zion to the earthly Mount Zion. Okay. Anyone else at this time? Okay. Shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've had together. We thank you for joining with us, for being with us, and for directing this conversation. Help us now to consider the symbols that we have seen. Help us to consider the example of Jephthah and his daughter. Direct us now so that that which we do will glorify you, your character, and your word. Help us to this today. For this we ask and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.